That looks great. All right. Okay, let's talk about dose symmetry and treatment of differentiated thyroid cancer and what we're going to do. I wanted to mention again Saul Hertz. I think he he's, was a true pioneer and uh, I think that had to work hard to introduce a practice changing paradigm. I was honored to be the first Saul Hertz recipient uh, of the award when the Society of Nuclear Medicine uh, implemented it. Um, and uh, he he was he was a forward thinking thinker, no doubt about it. So at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center practice guidelines, we have uh, published some time ago a a kind of uh, review of the effectiveness of recombinant human TSH in preparation for radioiodine thyroid remnant ablation, and we we use that really for all of our high dose higher dose therapies. We, uh, we do uh, usually uh, not treat, uh, we, all of the patients who have, we do not treat low risk patients who may have lobectomy. There is more and more lobectomy being done at our institution for those low risk patients. And those are patients who are less than uh, less than one and a half uh, centimeters. Although Mike, uh, during the question and answer, he can discuss his criterion uh, for what he recommends. Uh, instead, we focus on intermediate and high risk who have total thyroidectomy, but the key point is total thyroidectomy. And I would say I agree with Seiza about anybody with a total thyroidectomy, they should have RAA ablation. Um, for this, we have defined ablation, and it varies somewhat in terms of the dose. I tend to give 100 millicuries if I'm managing the patient. Uh, 30 to 50 is probably more common now, unless there's some reason to think that adjuvant treatment might be needed, and that would be an adverse, uh, an adverse histology or genotype uh, would also elicit a higher dose. And then if there is any evident um, extension of disease, we, we usually go higher. All of the patients have uh, whole body dysymmetry. They all have whole body studies afterwards. We use a concept of maximum tolerated activity for, for everybody uh, because we found that in some instances, even relatively low doses, especially older patients, may be in a realm where you can get some bone marrow suppression. This slide actually it came from Alan Howe, I believe, but I liked it. Uh, so in the, in the post-thyroidectomy uh, situation, post-total thyroidectomy, remnant ablation is indicated. Here you've got curative intent. You're trying to get a clean sweep field so that you can more easily follow patients with thyroglobulin and also with imaging as needed. So the RAIA means RAI AVID group of patients. Uh, and this, this is an example of a patient with significant uptake in lungs. These are whole body uh, images after treatment uh, versus the RAI refractory patient such as this, which is clearly RAI refractory. You see a bunch of disease uh, after, after therapy with IL-131, but you don't see uh, significant amounts of uptake. So I would call that RAI refractory. In this high group of high risk group of patients who have distant metastatic disease, uh, we, we, we have a regimen that lasts for six days and includes uh, whole body sweeps. It includes an emphasis on safe treatment doses uh, determined by dosimetry. And I think this has been pretty well adopted in the field. Uh, for body retention less than 120 millicuries at 48 hours or 80 millicuries in diffuse lung disease. We don't really have a limit on a single dose as many do, but it's unusual to give more than half a curie. Uh, I think it gets to be in a radiation safety realm if there should, God forbid, be a spill, for example. And salivary, salivary complications are a concern, but especially if you, if you give single doses, uh, above uh, 300 millicuries. 
anyway, this is a typical patient. Sometimes you don't see a lot of uptake on a on a uh, an initial dose with a with a diagnostic level of isotope, but you do often see you may see as in this case 400 millicuries. So of of dose you see very good uh, dense uptake, and this patient should not have more than 80 millicuries in their body at 48 hours. But I think those are kind of the past. What we're interested in now is the future. And I think the future is I-124. And we've been working on this for a long time. We developed I-124 at Memorial Sloan Kettering based on a Department of Energy grant, which allowed us to make this, this uh, target, which we call a Finn target after Ronald Finn. He's the one who designed it and made it. It's relatively easy to make I-124 at a hospital level cyclotron, but you must have an incident energy of 15 milli uh, MeV on the proton. Here's an example, a patient of mine, uh, 53 years old, numerous pulmonary nodules on routine chest X-ray uh, while being worked up for prostate cancer. Turned out he had papillary thyroid cancer on biopsy of his lung and he also was shown to have a two centimeter lesion with 13 of 23 lymph nodes in the neck. He's referred for dosimetry. I don't know how easy it is for you to see here, but there's a kind of miliary pattern if you look very closely at the chest X-ray. And you see he had tremendous amounts of uptake in his lung. And also notice that we have these spots which project over bones. Uh, I believe those are small residual tumors in, in the bone marrow where, where the lesions usually go first and then they spread to bone. Uh, they go to the bone marrow because of the blood. That's, that's my thought. It's a hypothesis more than a, more than a proven thing. But this patient had very high thyroglobulin when we first started to treat him. And then over time, we treated him for three years very intensively. In four doses, we gave him 1.5 millicuries, uh, 1.5 curies, 1,500 millicuries. We estimated the dose to his lesions was about 50,000 rads to the lymph node. It was more difficult for us to actually estimate the, the dose, but it was high, obviously, to his lung. And now the last uh, follow-up that I put on this chart was in 2017. So he's perfectly fine 2017, uh, 17 years later with a thyroglobulin at the lower limit of uh, at detectability. He still has some, uh, some uh, CT small fine nodules. This is what it was before. You see he had that miliary spread, then he got response. You see this is, he had very good distribution on the I-131 whole body uh, post-treatment scan. We were careful to ensure that he didn't get more than 200 rads to the blood with each dose and so on, and had the other uh, standards of 120 millicure at 48 and 80 millicure at, uh, uh, 80 millicure at, at 40, 48 in his body. No more than that. Now, I do believe that targeted radiotherapy can be curative in patients, but it's a matter of getting enough radiation dose and therapeutic index, hitting the sweet spot. I also think that there may be patients who have, who have genetic infirmities, but I think if you get enough radiation into the tumor without damaging the normal tissues, that's the point. That's what I mean by the sweet spot. And based on work I've done over the years and patients I've treated, I believe that most solid tumors are gonna require 10,000 rads to be cured. I know that for Maxon, he was talking about 8,000 and I think that some patients do get cured at that, but for renal dose, you must be careful not to exceed, really it's 2,300 or so, but I think you should keep it around 1,500 bone marrow dose, less than 150 and so on. This means that the therapeutic index must be very high for these normal tissues. So there's a major unmet need though to now go from just knowing about what are the normal tissues and what kind of dose are they getting to look at individual lesion dose. Love to know what that is. So with my colleagues, we put our 
thinking caps on and uh, like Rodolphe has done, we began to work trying to figure out what we should do. And I must say, we were tremendously stimulated by this, as I mentioned before in that talk, uh, RIA refractory model. These are some of our clinicians. Laura Bakai's name was mentioned. She's a, a very energetic woman who has uh, done a lot of work with the, with the uh, defining those super responders. Alan Ho uh, is the leader of many of our clinical trials and Mike is uh, the, the one who leads our clinical team and Jim uh, uh, leads the scientific direction as well as guides us all uh, from a general point of view as to rigor in our research. So these are the team in nuclear medicine. Uh, Alan, Alan is also the PI of that protocol, but John Hum is a physicist. Ravi Graywall is a nuclear medicine physician. And, and Audrey McGoon is a very brilliant uh, statistician who's done much of the work on the lesion dose symmetry I'm going to present today. So we're interested in I-124 as a theranostic. We want to look at the reinduction therapy for uh, refractory RAI, and also we want to sharpen our dose response for radioactive ionic. So we developed a concept called soothsayer that Soothsayer, of course, is Old English for truth teller, and it's an image-based dosimetry biomarker method of known precision, and it's based on a 48-hour measurement. The 48-hour measurement actually came from our guess in the New England Journal paper that 48 hours would be a pretty good time to actually make a single time point measurement because the uptake had pretty much occurred. And then we thought that it cleared with a half time of about 48 hours. Turns out that was, that was not true. It, most, most of the tumors do not clear that rapidly. In fact, they have very long-term retention so that the effective half-life is closer to the physical half-life of the I-131, which is eight days. Now, what we did was we used the MERD-based system. And I think you've already seen, for example, Cesar, I think, used this for his to estimate the doses in ablation. This is, we instead did the same thing, but we, we looked at each individual tumor in this group of patients. So we measured at four time points, 24, 48, 72, 96. Uh, those of us who are nuclear medicine geeks, we have a real uh, treat in store because the MERD pamphlet two is coming out. I've seen a, a, a prequel copy and uh, it defines this kind of area under the curve and what you should do to get accurate uh, dose symmetry. We gave six millicuries of sodium iodide 124. We determined the dose in rads in centigrade for each lesion using this area under the curve method. And once the area under the curve is defined, it's a simple matter to convert it to rads by multiplying times the, the equilibrium dose constant for island 31, which is 0.405. I think the trick is choosing a time near the uptake equilibrium. So clearance is relatively slow. And then Dr. Magoon did regression, regression statistics, looking at a variety of predictor parameters for, sync, for the single time point at 48 hours. She also looked at other time points as you'll see. And then she did a number of validation procedures, which are fairly standard for biomarker approaches like this of the leave one out cross-validation type. Let's see what that means. So again, this is the curve that's typical. Uh, we don't correct for radioactivity decay here. We're looking at the effective half-life. So it's, this is all the radioactivity over time. There are multiple time points. The MERD committee recommends at least four. Integrate under the curve using pretty much standard computer-based techniques. And once you get this A tilde, which is the activity integrated over time. You multiply times this delta, which is the equilibrium dose constant to get the total, and times the total dose of millicuries that you gave to get the estimated RADS to lesion. Now, SUV is a quantitative parameter, which is corrected for injected activity and body weight, but you can convert it back. It's proportional to the concentration in microcuries per gram in the tumor. 
Now the concept then was to use a single PET quantitative imaging time point at 48 hours to assess the correlation ex expressed as prediction interval for the integrated area under the curve proportional to the dose in centigrade. So first we took the initial 21 patients. There were 208 lesions. These patients all had advanced well-differentiated thyroid cancer and they were referred for dosimetry for our AI therapy. I described the methodology and in this then we developed that curve and but we looked to determine what was the optimal time point so we checked a bunch 24, 48, 72. We even, we even looked at more than one time point to see if we were missing anything. Uh, mean square error was what was the parameter we used to, to see which was the most precise or accurate. And then the algorithm was, was developed to show the correlation with 208 lesions. And we found that 48 hours was the uh, SUV was the optimal predictor and uh, correlation with the integrated area in the curve was validated. Let me show you how that was done. So this is this is one patient just to show at 24, 48, 72 hours, this patient actually had a little faster, significantly faster clearance than most of our patients, but you can see a lot of lesions in the lung. This is, these are all MIP uh, or, or multiple image uh, projection image, images, which shows a collection, a 3D collection of all of the activity projected. And we, got a number of parameters, the size of the lesion, the mean size and the CT, I mean the side of the lesion, the mean size and the CT, the lesion dose per millicury was computed, half-time effective was computed. And notice that a number of the lesions uh, in this particular data set uh, were very close to the physical half-life as I mentioned. Here in the curve in microcurie hours and so on was measured as well as SUV, the activity at millicurie was computed to deliver uh, 20 gray or 2000 rads. And we, we chose that threshold because this is in a, in, a, in a sense the maximum threshold for when there is a significant response. So it was kind of a threshold of response. And then each patient had a total dose administered and each patient had a maximum tolerated activity that was that was calculated from our normal tissue dosimetry. All right. I don't want you to read all this, although uh, Dr. Van Nostrand can certainly read it if he wishes. Basically though, I want to just point out a couple of things from this uh, algorithm description, how it was done. Uh, Dr. Magoon used a generalized estimating equation to make the correlation because they, all of the lesions, uh, some of the lesions in individual patients were thought to be correlated. So this takes that into account so that it makes the uh, statistics uh, appropriate for that. And it was used then to estimate the parameters of the best fit line in terms of the intercept slope and the robust variance matrix uh, for the correlation between the area under the curve and the uh, single predictor time point that we that we use. Uh, we also did some other things I'll come back to in a minute. Okay, here's, here's another typical patient. You see that the uptake was really very high in some of the patients. I mean, these, these are SUVs for you in nuclear medicine that are 200 to 400, some even 500 SUVs. That's fantastic. It means that there's just incredible concentration by these tissues. And so here's cross section. In other words, we could take advantage of the fact that we do fusion imaging. And so this is, you see that the patient has a lot of disease in bone. This is a, mostly in bone in this particular patient. And this is what we see. Now, Dr. Magoon used a log log uh, plot in order to linearize everything, makes it made it a lot easier. And what you have here is the line that is the best fit between the SUV, the log of the SUV here plotted. For example, this is an SUV of 20, which turns out to be a three on a natural log. And basically 
each of these points represents all of the 208 data points. And you can see that a couple of them are outside, but that's to be expected because this is the prediction interval, which is meant to cover 95%. So you see that it, there is a known precision. So probably the best single estimate of lesion dose can be calculated from the AUC that lies on this line. So for 20, 20 uh, an SUV of 20 of an individual lesion, uh, incorporating all of the data in the 208 patients, you get with 90% probability that it's gonna, the true value will lie between these lines, between the, the upper and the lower bound of the 95% prediction interval. But this line, the best number is probably right on that line. So uh, Dr. Magoon looked at a bunch of different predictors like Michael Curie per gram at 24 hours and so forth. And the long story short, she also looked at uh, standardized uptake lean, which is another one of the met parameters available to us and found that really the SUV at 48 hours uh, was the, had the least squared error at 0.204. Now there was one other, uh, and, and then she also looked to see if it added very much uh, to combine measurements, like at 48 plus something at 72. And to make a long story short, no, it didn't. In fact, it made it a little worse. The squared error was less uh, with this number. You see it's 0.204 here and it's 0.224 uh, with comparable uh, uh, SUL and SUV. So the, <coughs> the output of these, let's see, I was gonna, there was one other thing I was gonna mention. The output is really twofold of that algorithm that you, that you saw with the, with the, the, if you hark back to the line. And it is the area under the curve with the precision bars. But then we can also get a very good idea of how many millicuries we need to give to achieve 2000 gray at a particular SUV. And in this case, we use the upper bound and uh, we know then that 90% of all of the lesions that have an SUV of let's say 20, if you treat with 217 millicuries, all of those lesions will have at least uh, 2000 rats. So if that's your lowest lesion, let's say SUV of 20 is your lowest lesion, you know that all of the tumors are gonna get that much at least. Now, one of the ways to test these things, these are all 21 of the patients, is to show agreement about the prediction interval for the actual measured AUV, which now you remember, we measure it with the MERD approach versus the prediction, which is shown here in blue. And all of these things lie on a line there's a 4% lie off or 6% lie off the line, but we thought that was pretty good because this is after all the statistical thing. So 94% agreement there. But then a second thing was done where you, where you take one patient out and then use all the other 20 to compute your line of identity again. And then you make your comparison. And so with each of those leave one outs, you then can, um, look back and, and see how well you did with this covariance uh, squared error, where you, where you take that one out. You see that it's really very good, it's still good. So that means that uh, this is considered a very good sign that the algorithm is behaving like we expect to predict the relationship between the two parameters. Now, in addition to this, she did a simulation study of the first 15 patients to see how many patients we'd have to have to make those prediction interval uh, constrict to be as small as possible. So she simulated the N, the, for N similar patients with between three and 23 lesions, that was the range we, we saw in our patients. Uh, she simulated the 48 hour time points and the corresponding AUCs and so forth and give an idea about what 
what is the practical number to reduce the prediction intervals? And what she found was that if you increase the number of subjects by four times, so from 15 to 60, you constrict the prediction interval by approximately half, to about half of what it was. But so that, now the, the one other thing I wanted to measure, the actual error is estimated as a distance between this line and each of these points. And then because some of them are uh, less and some of them are more, you, you use a squared error. So this is kind of standard statistical approach. And then you have defined a, a, an equation that connects this prediction uh, of the AUC and the measured SUV, and it follows this form. And you can see the intercept and the, and the error bars and so forth. Now, 15 of these patients were treated with RAI from the 21, uh, and 96% of the lesions did have a 2000 centigrade or more, which I've called the maximum threshold for response in a majority of tumor. I think that validates our millicury RAI prediction that we used. And uh, that I think we were, we were happy about that. Uh, and the individual mean lesions uh, also was, uh, uh, was also validated in that way by the leave patient, one patient out comparison because it was a very, very, uh, there was some, some widening of the intervals, but that was expected, but it was very small. The concept then is to take the AUC, as I said, multiply it times this 0 0.405, which is the equilibrium dose constant for, for I-131 to get a total dose millicury in rats per lesion. And this is what it looked like. So you see that some of the lesions got enormous uptake. In fact, the mean, 50% of the lesions got more than 22,000 gray in this, in this group of patients. Now these were carefully screened patients and, and we, we have pretty high standards for treating our patients, but we were happy to see that all except something like about, I believe it was four, four to 6% of patients had the 2000 of gray uh, dose, the threshold, they achieved that. So all of those lesions uh, we saw, but that is the range we see. Again, this is, the, this is one of the patients you can see, as I said, a tremendous number of lesions cross section through with, with PET CT. We really believe in this largest safe dose because we, we are giving larger doses than others. And I think you get you have to give those large doses if you want to achieve anything close to uh, 2,000 rads to to the tumors. And I think that as we as we go forward uh, with our therapy, I suggest that we begin to treat radioactive iodine now with a little more rigor, like we would treat any other drug, and be careful about looking at response. And if we know what the dosimetry is, I think it's gonna help us enormously. I'm so impressed with what has been accomplished by our friends in radiation oncology and largely because they know how much dose they give to the tumor and they know how much dose they give to the normal, the normal tissues. So there's, we, we're, this soothsayer methodology we think is, that could be important. We're anxious to uh, develop more information about it and see if we can uh, make it even more robust. But it is does provide us with a centigrade dose of known precision, which we can improve by adding more patients. And we also now will work on the normal tissue and see if we can do the same thing at each of those four time points, for example, with the and develop a test set of, of 21 patients at least uh, for looking at normal organ dose and see if a single measurement will predict with and what kind of precision it will predict uh, dose to normal organs. Although 
in, in practical sense, our blood draw whole body probe counts has, has served us well. We still feel it'd be nice to have better precision for actual dose in terms of correlating uh, treatment response. So this method is data-driven. It's applicable to other targeted radiotherapy approaches. And now that we're getting into targeted radiotherapy in a big way, with individual lesion dose and organ dose, we're gonna need it or something like it for Lutathera, PSMA 617, and a number of agents that all of us are working on, including us uh, in the laboratory. So thanks very much for your attention. This uh, I should acknowledge uh, NIH grant as what we use to develop this uh, initial, uh, initial stage of SUSE. So thank, right, thank you very much.